Thank you. And if you don't think going across town and seeing your face that big <laughs> is something, then you're wrong. <laughs> October 29, 2018, a plane went down just outside of Indonesia and lives were lost. It's my job. 189 lives were lost. Another plane went down just the 10th of March of this year, and 157 more lives were lost. The same make and model of airplane, and the world watched. Many of us were riveted. Perhaps we didn't want to be on that next plane to go down. That's 173 people on average for those two flights. There's a disease which causes the equivalent of about seven of those jets going down, not every week, but every day. And the world did not notice. I'm here to tell you what we're doing to address the worldwide problem of malaria. When you think of Africa, I'm sorry, malaria, what do you think of? For me, I think of Africa so much I stumbled and said Africa. <laughs> Do you think of bed nets? Do you think of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation? You probably all have different things you think about, but you probably don't think of this next person. That's Dr. Seuss holding one of his children's books. Before he became Dr. Seuss, he worked for the military, and he drew up a pamphlet for them to encourage people to take their drugs, to avoid behaviors that would cause mosquito bites, because the military was losing, in many theaters of the war, more fighting capacity to mosquitoes and malaria than they were to the enemy. Now, mosquitoes are an important part of the story because, as is famous for malaria, the disease gets from the infected person, infects a mosquito, and then that mosquito transmits to another person. The form of the disease changes multiple times as it goes through these transitions, makes it very complex, but this also gives multiple points at which to attack the disease. This is a marvelous book. It gives lots of information, including the fact that into the mid-20th century, there was still residual malaria here in the United States. But we don't hear about that anymore. You don't hear your neighbor saying, my child is down with malaria this week. That's because we've eliminated it within our bounds, and we did so many years ago. And we did so with a combination of a lot of spraying of insecticides, largely and famously DDT, and we did this with drugs to cure the disease, such as chloroquine and its predecessors. But tragically, we've been losing all our drugs for malaria to drug resistance by the parasite, and we're losing insect control continuously through the insects becoming resistant to the parasite. I'm sorry, to the uh, sprays, the insecticides. So this map, a rather famous map amongst malaria workers, shows the march of drug resistance to the gold standard of malaria cures for half a century, but we lost it over the decades and we lost it as people who were infected with a drug-resistant parasite would move or visit a new region, the mosquitoes there would bite and transmit to new people in that region, and the disease becomes established again and again across geographical boundaries. So what we're doing to address drug resistance is to start with that gold standard malaria drug, chloroquine, add to it another drug 
which can turn off the mechanism of resistance and then put them together into a new class of drug, which I termed a little over a decade ago, the reversed chloroquine drugs. And our lead compound now is one called DM1157, DM for design medics, my micropharma, no, nanopharma company. So the way this works in just a little more detail, I won't overwhelm you, is in the blood resides the red blood cells, which normally carries the oxygen but can be infected by the single cell malaria parasite. And you dose a patient to cure the patient. The drug goes into the blood, goes into the red blood cell, into the parasite, and into a small portion of that parasite called the digestive vacuole. You're learning some terminology today, aren't you? And inside that digestive vacuole, which you can think of as the stomach of the parasite, accumulates the chloroquine and it can kill the parasite until drug resistance evolves. And it evolved when transporters mutated through evolution and gained the ability to leak out the chloroquine. As it leaked out, the parasites could then live in the presence of the drug and we call that resistance. Now you can add that reversal agent as I showed you a couple of illustrations ago and that can bind to the transporter even if it's mutated and bung it up like sticking in a potato, okay? And slow down the leak and sort of drive the drug back to effectiveness. My hypothesis was we could do this more efficiently by putting these two entities together as a single molecule. And they would then want to really stay in the parasite, stay in that digestive vacuole, kill the parasite. Did it work? Here's the first version of this. This slides for you chemists in the audience. And it works like this. You take the drug and administer it to cell cultures of the chloroquine resistant parasites, which you see in dark green, or chloroquine sensitive parasites, which you see in light green. And it takes a lot of drug to kill the parasites in dark green and very little drug, very potent against the drug sensitive parasites. Now, we move to our drug. As Bono sang, even better than the real thing. <laughs> so, we were off and running, synthesized hundreds of these drugs, chose the one we felt was best to go into humans as a practical thing. And right now, after many years of building up the evidence you need to get approval from the Food and Drug Administration to dose humans, we're in a phase one clinical trial. Healthy volunteers, does it help, does it work? We'll find out if it works in the phase two trial, assuming we get through the phase one trial without any major glitches. And that'll be the first time it encounters patients with the disease, probably in West Africa. If that works out, then you go to multi-center, large-scale phase three trials before you can go to market. The whole goal here is not to do just what we did in the US, eliminate the disease. We want to do that within geographical boundaries and then move to the next geographical boundary and then the next geographical boundary, eliminate, 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 leading to eradication. And that's the word we reserve for no more parasites. How are we doing? Well, start by following the money. Here is the world spending for implementation of malaria drugs over the last approximate decade. And you can see we flatlined. We need more resources. And we need more resources because we need to track how these budgets have consequences. And the first consequence you can see is malaria deaths are being reduced. And on the other side, you can see the number of cases worldwide is in fact not 
changing. And the problem is for elimination to eradication strategies, what really matters is number of cases because that reflects the number of parasites out there in the population. So we need to do better. What do we need those resources for? We've been living in the top right-hand corner of this illustration, just more drugs. And lots of people are working on other drugs. There's more than what we're doing. There are at least four such projects I know of in Oregon, which is fabulous. But we need to control mosquitoes. We need better vaccines. You might have heard of a couple of trials starting this last couple of weeks. We need better infrastructure because we need to reduce mosquito breeding. Not only do we need more resources, but you all have a role. Advocacy, for example. And I understand compassion fatigue, and that's a big one for malaria because the best estimate I know of for how long it's going to take to eradicate this disease lists it at about 20 to 25 years. So, over and over, you're probably going to forget. And I need you to remember again. So the next time a tragedy, an earthquake, an airplane goes down, remember also all those children who are the major losses for malaria. And we can do this. We can do this with an attitude of global citizenship and resilient empathy. Hold on to this. Because to eliminate malaria is to have economies rise. We know this. Because if children survive, the women who have those children have fewer babies, and their lives and their families' lives improve because settling for a transmissible disease control program is to settle for more evolution of resistance to arise again and again. And that's unacceptable because the world's most valued, most vulnerable people are suffering because it's just the right thing to do and because we can. Thank you.